Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Luke Gran with Practical Farmers of Iowa, and I'm really excited to, to be hosting tonight with uh, two great speakers from near Iowa City. And I uh, just wanted to thank you all for coming. And if you could put your email address and your location in the chat box, we like to, to kind of uh, see where folks are coming from tonight. And it helps the speakers to kind of try to target their, 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 their talk to, to the audience. We are on building wholesale relationships, and we are in our spring farm in our series. Last week, we had a great session on managing farm labor with farmers as the speakers. And if you missed that one, you can access it on our website, practicalfarmers.org slash farminar. We've got every week now through April 5th, every Tuesday night, we'll have another farmer-led farmer session with farmers as the speakers. So we encourage you all to, to join us again. Uh, and this is a great way to learn for free uh, online. We wanted to thank our, our supporting partners, uh, FarmAid and the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program that make it possible to pay the speakers for their knowledge and their time, and we really appreciate that support. If you're not a PFI member, a Practical Farmers of Iowa member, I would really encourage you strongly to join uh, right now. Go online, practicalfarmers.org, and if you're, if you're also able, we'd love to have your donation to make more of this uh, online learning possible and to further, further strengthen our grassroots organization. And as I mentioned earlier, if you would like to see recordings, uh, this session and all sessions that we do are recorded and available free online at practicalfarmers.org slash farminar. We like to update our grassroots membership all the time, what we're up to and, and how we're answering their their, their, uh, their requests for, for services and programming. So I just wanted to take a minute and explain what we're up to right now. We are putting together research projects, coordinating with farmers all across the state in all different enterprises, all different size farms, uh, for farmer-led research, where farmers ask the questions and do the research and follow up and share that knowledge for free with anyone. We have over 25 years of, of uh, rich uh, knowledge of, of farmer-led research on our website, and we continue that uh, very strongly as a part of our work. Um, and we really, really value that. So we'll be doing research projects all summer. Our field day planning is this Friday uh, at noon. We're going to start planning out a 20, 25 or so event season of on-farm field days where you can learn from farmers for free on their farms. That's a really great member benefit as well. You get a field day guide in, in May, which is a great, uh, great brochure you can look through and see what, what great opportunities there are to learn on farms all summer long. Additionally, we, uh, we are a grant-funded organization, so we spend a good amount of time in this, this time uh, and all year throughout the year, actually, uh, writing grants to ensure that we can uh, pay ourselves with grants, pay the staff with grants, but also pay our farmers for their, their knowledge and for coordinating all the great uh, learning from farmers that they do in our uh, in our organization. We also have a couple great opportunities. If you're a farmer in Iowa and you you market your own produce or uh, meats or cheese or anything, uh, there's an opportunity to learn about branding on March 25th. And if you're interested in learning more about branding yourself with a uh, marketing uh, strategist consultant. This is a great opportunity. It's free for members, or just $35, I believe, for non-members. And if you just want to send an email to sally at practicalfarmers.org, you can learn more about that and, and get RSVP'd for that event. It should take place in Des Moines, Iowa. We also have youth mini-grants available. Uh, we have uh, The deadline is April 15th to apply. So if you have any children under the age of 18, uh, they would be able to apply for small mini grants, the, the amount of $50 to $250, depending on the project, to do their own youth on-farm research or demonstration. And if you don't live on a farm, you can also apply for uh, in-town uh, farm research or food research and demonstration projects. We, we encourage you to check that out on our website. So tonight, let's get started with the building wholesale relationships topic. Uh, with our two guests from Iowa City. You can take it away, guest. Good evening. My name is Derek Roller. I'm the owner and operator of Ecoleptive Farms uh, in Cedar County, Iowa. Um, I'm here with Mike Rowe from New Pioneer Co-op, and we're going to talk about uh, 
our relationship um, that we've developed over the years. Um, so my farm markets to our local co-op, New Pioneer, uh, as well as as a CSA. acre farm of which uh, 14 is um, worked up every year, cover crops, vegetables. Uh, we do quite a bit of season extension. Um, we have been certified organic in the past, uh, but we elected to drop our certification um, when the federal government took over and also when they dropped the cost share. So I would like to invite you to ask any questions that you have uh, as we go along, um, touching on our subjects. And then we'll also have a time at the end uh, for questions. So our, our outline that we're going to cover tonight, um, we're going to talk about how to approach new customers. Um, we're going to talk about pricing. Um, we're also going to talk about order and delivery process. Um, we'll touch on contracts and how to maintain a steady supply. So the first thing I'd like to talk about a little bit is um, pricing and how we decide on what to price and how to price. Um, when I sit down with Mike, we always have a sit down meeting every year. And uh, we usually do that in December try to decide uh, what exactly we're growing and to set our prices for the year. Um, the co-op being a member-based co-op and they have you know one of their main objectives uh, is to support local food. So they have uh, we have a much more personable relationship with them than say a corporation that's just looking to turn profits. Um, so that gives us a little leeway as far as pricing. Um, they, they're able to help us a little bit um, on some of the items that, is di that are difficult for smaller farmers to produce um, and meet the price point of the larger farmers. When, when, we sit, when I sit down with Mike, um, we decide what exactly uh, I'll be growing for the, for the co-op that year. We, we cover the past year. We talk about what went well, what didn't go so well, why it didn't go well, or why it did go well. Um, we talk about how the price that we had the year before, how that worked out. Um, we also discuss if there's flexibility to either raise the price or if there's need to keep the price the same or if there's any ability to lower the price. Um, we'll, we also will discuss um, whether we can sell the item in a different manner uh, that may be more appealing to the customer or will maybe generate more revenue for our partnership. Um, so I've tried to grow a lot of things uh, for the co-op. They've been a wonderful supporter of my farm. Um, and through the years, I've found out that not everything grows great. 
uh, at our farm. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is to, uh, you know, know what your soils can handle. My farm was uh, farmed hard commercially for a very long time. There was a period of time, I think, where it was 30 years straight corn. And uh, so some of our soils are a bit depleted. Um, we're also uh, a new farm in that, uh, you know, I don't come into this with um, my parents farming, so um, I'm starting new, gathering all my own equipment. Uh, I do not own the land, I rent. Um, and so you factor in all those things when you decide uh, what exactly you can handle um, as far as amounts and what varieties. Um, I also had an eye to what the existing market was as far as pricing, uh, what was out there uh, originally, and um, if it's something that we want to compete with uh, or to cooperate with, or if it was um, something that nobody out there produced and maybe we wanted to try a new item. Um, we also have worked hard over the years to, to work in what we wholesale into our overall farm plan. In my introduction, I mentioned that we market a variety of different ways, from wholesaling to re retailing to direct marketing to internet sales, and all those things you know, play into uh, the calendar throughout the year. Um, you, can, you can definitely overload your plate um, if you put too many items uh, you know, coming due at the same time. Or, So next I would like to talk about uh, the ordering and delivering process that Ecolective and New Pioneer have worked out. Um, now the title of, of this farminar tonight is Building Wholesale Relationships. Uh, there, there is a caveat. Um, a collective and uh, new pioneers relationship, I think, is much more personable uh, than than a majority of the wholesale uh, relationships out there. We have been more like partners through the years, um, in that we will together will identify an item that we would like to put on the shelves, and we'll have discussions. We'll have back and forth. Uh, we'll try things. Um, because we're both interested in seeing, you know, that item there for years and to, um, you know, have, have it be a local item. Uh, so one of the places where that, that partnership uh, shows itself, in my opinion, is the flexibility in our ordering and delivering process. Um, New Pioneer has been nice enough uh, throughout the years to allow us to deliver. Um, we usually deliver in the evenings. We deliver after we've worked all day and, you know, we've done our picking and all our working. And then so we're not delivering during daylight hours because um, the daylight is so important to us. Um, now, that said, I don't know, you know, uh, every... Every um, situation is going to be different. Um, we do two to three ordering sessions a week. So usually it's two. Uh, I'll call Mike on Monday for a Tuesday night delivery, and I'll call him on Thursday, usually in the mornings, uh, for a Friday night delivery. That gives us... Um, you know, a good amount of time to get that delivery together as well as all our other deliveries that we're doing. We tend to uh, do some of our retail and farmer's market deliveries on different days. We don't lump all that together on one day so that we can just focus on one customer at a time. We 
we think we can give better service that way. Um, uh, so we take our order in Monday. Um, I'm able to put together a work, you know, the work list for the day, and we're able to um, do all our harvesting and post-harvest handling in that time and able to deliver a product uh, that has been cleaned, uh, washed, it's been chilled uh, if, it, if it needs that. Um, it's been packaged if it needs that. Um, that time labeling could be done. Um, and we tend to put our invoices together at that time so that when we go to load the truck, everything is ready. Um, and we, the co-op has two locations. We tend to do our deliveries back-to-back. Uh, -back. Um, and so it would take us, you know, our farm is half an hour away from, from New Pioneer. So we'll drive in, we'll do our one delivery, go through our invoicing, uh, and do our other delivery, and then we'll be done for the day. Uh, all our ordering is done via the phone, um, directly with the produce managers of each department, Mike Crow being one in Coralville, and um, Steve Moan is the other one there in uh, Iowa City. Um, there has been some talk of, you know, sending out a weekly email on availability um, but for our specific relationship, we already pretty much know what we're growing and that they, you know, and that um, the co-op wants it. Uh, when we sit down and do our contracts, there is usually just one primary grower, so it's not as if there's, you know, five different people growing lettuces. Um, What are some of the things you grow for New Pioneer, Derek? <clears throat> we grow a lot of stuff. Uh, we always comment how long our meeting is in the wintertime to go through all our different stuff. Uh, we grow garlic um, and, a, you know, all the different, all the different um, shapes of garlic. So we have the dry garlic from, uh, you know, August until Thanksgiving. Um, green garlic in the spring. Uh, we do the garlic scapes. Um, and then we do quite a few other alliums. We do leeks. Uh, we'll do a sweet onion, some storage onion. Uh, we do shallots. Um, we do a few herbs. We do parsley, both curly and flat. Uh, we do dill. Um, we do sun gold cherry tomatoes. Uh, we pack those in pints. Uh, we do baby bok choy, uh, we do arugula, uh, um, both bulk uh, and pre-bagged. We have a braising mix, we have a hot peppers mix, um, and we do head lettuce, um, we do spinach, fingerling potatoes, asparagus, if you grow peas, uh, I'm sure there's a few other things in there that I'm forgetting. So I should touch on how our relationship or partnership first started, um, you know, which would work into how to approach new customers. Uh, years ago, I had a restaurant. Here we have a question. Do I have a certified processing area? Uh, no, I do not. So uh, when I first approached New Pioneer, I had a restaurant and I um, grew, was growing food for my restaurant uh, 
and I asked the produce manager in Iowa City. At that time, there was only one location. Uh, if you'd be interested in some extra produce that I had. And, you know, we went back and forth a little bit. He was really interested in it, uh, but he just wanted to make sure that the quality was good, um, you know, that I could uh, have a steady supply um, for them. Um, and so we started really small. I think it was maybe arugula or bok choy or just some few little things that I had, you know, enough of, enough to offer for a few weeks. Uh, and the local food movement was just kind of starting to get going here in Iowa City. And um, so it started really small. It was actually very informal. You know, it was a face-to-face -face meeting, um, you know, and then it evolved into phone calls. Uh, and since then, you know, it's become much more regular. I've since sold the restaurant. I just focus on farming. And um, I've made my relationship with New Pioneer be one of the central pillars um, in my farm. I like the relationship. I like the wholesaling relationship. I've definitely heard horror stories, you know, um, as far as relationships with farms and wholesalers. Um, my relationship is very strong. I don't, you know, the co-op is never just going to dump me on the side of the road one week after I've grown them a field full of something. Um, and so in that I can trust and uh, feel confident when I grow it. Uh, I would caution you uh, as a growers, as growers out there, to just really make sure that um, the per your, your purchaser is, in fact, going to cut you a check and is, in fact, going to buy your food uh, if you grow it for them. Um, several ways to approach New customers, uh, I've done all of these. We just had a local meet, meet and greet. It was a buyers and sellers meeting, basically. Um, I met some new people, as well as saw some old faces there. Just a real good time to, uh, to you know, reestablish contact or make new contact, uh, as well as, you know, begin relationships or... or um, begin to feel out, you know, if you want to work with somebody or not. Um, I've tried email as far as for approaching new customers, but I imagine that all the buyers I'm trying to email get quite a few emails. Uh, I know I get quite a few emails, and I have a hard time keeping up with uh, the ones from folks I know, let alone from somebody I don't know. Uh, word of mouth. Uh, it's great, you know, you hear uh, there's a new restaurant in town. I guess that's not so much wholesaling, but if you hear, you know, there might be a possibility um, or your friend just got a job at some place, you want to follow up on all those kind of possibilities. Um, the best one is when they approach you. They, you know, uh, when they come and say, well, I've heard, you know, you're a good grower, you grow this product, we're looking for this product, can we have some sort of relationship? That obviously saves you a lot of time and energy, um, making phone calls and emails and all this kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, meeting people face-to-face -face is good. Grocery stores, you can always go in, you know, in the slow time of season, go in and try to find the produce manager, you know, try to meet with him, try to give him a list of product that you could possibly grow for him uh, or her. Um, during this season, um, just to give them an idea. You're going to want to have an idea uh, on pricing. They're going to ask you right away, well, what, what price is this? Um, and, you know, that's, for, for a lot of beginning folks, that's a tricky one. Um, I've sort of just, you know, stumbled into it. Uh, there's obviously a window in which you can operate in within your pricing. Um, it took me years to finally kind of settle on what we do. Um, and so I mentioned, I've mentioned contracts a couple times. Um, I mentioned being confident in being able to sell things to New Pioneer. Uh, we do sit down and um, form a contract between the farm and the store. Um, in that contract, we identify you know, who the primary, that there's going to be one primary grower, that's going to be me, 
We identify um, what exactly that product is. If it's if it's leaf lettuce, we say it's red leaf lettuce. Um, we, we don't necessarily um, identify exactly how much per week I'm going to sell um, because a lot of that is based on how much people are going to buy, um, obviously. But Mike is able to give me, you know, statistics on what they sold the year before on a week by week basis so I can see when there's spikes, you know, because people just suddenly realized it's spring and they want to buy green leafy things or or whatever it is. So I can look at those and I can use that to try to um, plan my, my planting dates so that I can uh, maintain a steady supply of, of products for them. Um, because they're going to, that's what, exactly what they're going to want. They don't want, you know, too much one week and not enough another week. And maybe, maybe I have it and maybe I don't. Um, and so when those con, when we settle on those contracts, I'm using those. I'm, I'm, I'm checking back on those every couple weeks, you know, see where I'm at. Do, do I have all my seed ordered? You know, do I have my field plan laid out for all this different stuff? Um, and I try and update Mike uh, on how it's going. Some buyers are not going to care about that. Um, they just want to see it at the end. Um, but I do that so that um, I can appraise them of, you know, when it's going to be ready. Because they, you know, if it's lettuce, well, they have to have lettuce 52 weeks out of the year. You know, they, uh, so I need to let them know, you know, a week, 10 days ahead of time when I'm going to start to bring them lettuce uh, so that so that they're able to move through uh, the product that they got. They know not to order it ahead of time so that as soon as I have it, it can get on the shelves. But some of these things here in Iowa, you know, spring can come and go in a matter of, you know, a month. And so if we miss a week or 10 days of sales because I was slow letting them know that something was going to be ready, um, well, that could be potentially 25% you know, percent of the crop. Um, so those updates and those forecastings are really important. Um, and it also helps me you know, figure out what all my plans are um, and what my work lists are and things like that for the week. Um, that helps me. I use all that when I, when I try and um, sit down and plan so that I can maintain a steady supply of the product, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, we're looking to to have exactly as much as they need for as long as possible. You know, that's where we're going to make our name for ourselves and where we're going to make um, the co-op a happy customer. Um, and in order to do that, um, you know, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to help us with that. We have, um, you know, January, February, we have planning um, where we sit down and try to plan our successions. Okay, so, you know, I want to get them 10 cases of uh, red leaf lettuce a week. Okay, so how am I going to do that? You know, you sit down and figure out how many flats you got to start every week um, and then figure out, you know, how many you got to transplant. And uh, we also do quite a bit of season extension so that we're able to, um, you know, extend the season on some of these crops uh, so that we don't run up against where we only have four weeks of something, four weeks of bok choy. We're able to provide, you know, another four weeks using simple season extension uh, in the spring, or maybe it makes, uh, makes it possible to offer head lettuce in the fall, where maybe we could only have one or two weeks of head lettuce in the fall with season extension. Now we have six. Okay, now we have a product that we can offer to our wholesale market. Um, so season extension, we have the planning. We have installed, uh, you know, irrigation because we have to, we have to have uh, water in a timely manner to help to stay on our on our succession plantings. Um, sometimes we can't just wait for the rain because then that might mean that we have one week or two week lag because we have a dry spell, stuff isn't sizing up, and all of a sudden we get a rain, and now we have three times 
too much lettuce uh, to sell and nowhere, you know, lettuce doesn't keep nowhere to sell it. So we keep irrigation on hand as a tool. Um, and that seems to be more important uh, to my wholesale account than to some of the other areas. I mean, obviously, it helps in, you know, a severe drought. It helps keep everything alive for all my markets. But, you know, for those small windows of three or four days where you really need, um, when if you're trying to stay on a schedule. Um, so... Uh, all the, we use all those things um, for maintaining a steady supply. I've, uh, you know, through the years, I've tried to identify uh, what we can mechanize um, to help us either either bring a crop in uh, at, a, at a lower cost to us so that we can pass that savings on so then that it can make the shelf. I mean, obviously, I can't uh, go out there and dig every potato by hand and charge Mike, five dollars a pound for potatoes, um, just as an example. You know, so we've mechanized our our potatoes. Um, and uh, also figured out uh, what we cannot mechanize, you know, or can't afford to. I can't afford a uh, you know a salad greens harvester and or the tractor to run it. Um, so I have to figure out, um, well, can I get labor uh, and, and can I get that done correctly at a certain price? Um, you know, every, every labor area in different parts of the country is different. Uh, whether you can, you know, maintain experienced people or not. All those things will work into whether you can supply a steady supply of something or, you know, it's going to all work into your pricing. Um, I would say, you know, wholesaling is definitely, uh, you want to have a little bit more of a mature farm. You don't want to just jump into it right away. You want to be confident in your product. You want to have a good product. Um, you want to know how to handle it, how to present it. Um, and through the years, our relationship works really well. Now, I don't really have any other wholesaling accounts. I do some things, uh, some other things that fall a little bit into wholesaling, but and that's by choice. I'm not looking to uh, add too much more to my my plate as far as wholesaling. Um, I like I said, it is uh, my relationship with the co-op is a pillar, and but they keep. They keep my farm busy, that and my other marketing arrangements, um, and just our proximity to town and things like that. So, um, yeah. Well, I guess I'll take over now. My name's Mike Krogh, and I'm the local produce coordinator for New Pioneer Co-op. We're a grocery store. Um, we're a member-owned business, and um, as you can see here, we have 20,000 plus members. We've been in business for 40 years. We started really small um, back in the early 70s as a sort of a buying club with bags of bulk dried beans and bulk grains and things like that. But over the years, we've we've grown and we've become a a two location store and part of our mission is to support local local economies and I can speak for the produce end of things but we also sell um, locally produced meat, dairy, eggs, cheese, even beer. Um, we have some restaurants that provide us with food, things like hummus, um, even tortilla chips different processed foods. So we try to try to fill the shelves as much with local as possible, but it is it is a struggle and it's really it's not a huge percentage of what we offer and it there's there really is a lot of opportunity there. Um, here's a picture of the the Coralville store. We just had our tenth anniversary of this store um, in February. 
Um, so as I said, um, part of my job is to try and source as much produce uh, locally as possible, and that there are challenges that go along with that. Now, I'd say in terms of organic, lots of our customers have the perception that we only sell organic food. Um, I, in the produce department right now, I'd say we're about 90% organic product, and that sort of changes in the local season. We have lots of growers that aren't actually certified organic, like Derek here, but we know um, we can trust their growing methods. We do care about that. Um, lots of growers have issues with the certification process, don't feel that it's stringent enough. Lots of people don't. If they're smaller, it takes money. It takes a lot of time to go through the process. Um, we do see it as a value to us and our customers. I like to be able to put a sign up that says that the product's organic. It is a federally regulated word um, in terms of food. So if you're not certified organic, I can't put a sign up that says um, organic. And that's that's the first thing the customers see. So if if the grower isn't certified, I'll get asked a lot, and then I'll have to go through a whole spiel with the customer explaining, you know, yes, this, this grower is okay. Um, we do deal with a lot of growers in a year. Um, as Derek was talking about, I, I meet with growers early on in the year, and uh, I make commitments. Um, we have a purchase agreement. Derek called it a contract, but uh, um, I probably have purchase agreements with a dozen, 14 growers or so. But beyond that, we get, you know, I'll get calls throughout the season, new people that show up um, looking to grow stuff for us, or they just happen to have a bunch of product, and sometimes we need it, sometimes we don't. Um, and as you see here, some of the some of the things we sell, mainly veggies are local. Um, to some extent, fruit, herbs, we do sell starts. Um, Uh, starts in the spring, um, some flowers in season. We even have a, a grower that's providing us with some shiitake mushrooms and oyster mushrooms. So that's that's nice to have those. Um, so in terms of our, our local contribution to the economy, um, probably over, over $300,000 annually in local purchases. Um, so over the years, we've, we've put millions of dollars back into the local economy, as well as provided local food to our members. So it kind of goes two ways, and it's that makes it fulfilling uh, to me. Um, and our sales volumes, they, they are still increasing, and the local contribution to our sales, that is also increasing. But still, only 16% of our produce purchases are local in a given year. So Part of my job is to find out how to increase that percentage. Um, and I'm sure all you know these things, but um, these are the advantages of buying local that we try to educate our members with um, through marketing, and and we have an education uh, person at the co-op um, that keeps these issues in the forefront. And growing produce in Iowa, there are there are limitations. Like I said before, we see a lot more vegetable product, um, fruits to some extent. You know, half our department is fruit, and it's very seasonal in Iowa. Like strawberries, what well, you get two weeks, maybe a month max out of strawberries. Um, we're gonna sell bananas because that's what our members want. And I don't know of anyone growing bananas in Iowa. Um, and the the limitation seasonally, um, you know, things start slow in the spring, and there's it's all leafy stuff. You get your lettuces and spinaches and stuff. And we do have some greenhouses that you know start pumping out the summery crops and in late April and May. So we we are able to get some 
peppers and cucumbers and things like that. But um, it is it is very seasonal depending on the product. Um, and the winter, like right now, end of winter, I got I might have ten local products in the store. Um, so there's there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's a lot of um, prohibitive factors to the grower in in producing product in the months of you know January, February, March. So and there are there are limitations in in terms of specific crops um, due to due to our climate. You know, it gets hot in the summer. Lettuce doesn't like the heat. So at the after the end of June, we're we're we we don't have local lettuce. It's going to be bitter. It's not going to be any good. So you know, we'll go from July, August, September. You know, maybe the end of September we can start seeing some lettuce again, but most likely not till October. So we have issues like that where, yeah, we'll have it local in the spring, but then then we got to go back to sourcing it out of California, where their climate's more conducive to to growing that. So that's 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 another of the limitations of um, supplying local to our customers. And in terms of approaching new customers, I would just, in general, I would just identify um, who who needs produce, who uses fresh produce. I work for a grocery store. Derek talked about dealing with restaurants. They're often very supportive and um, can feature local product pretty well. In Iowa City, we have a lot of <clears throat> restaurants that are enthusiastic about supporting local and we have a community here that's very receptive to that. Um, I know in this area there are some smaller regional produce distributors that do buy locally produced product. Um, I can't really speak to that. Um, there's big pushes lately to get uh, local food into schools, for instance. There's universities. I know Iowa State's been moving a lot towards trying to source more local stuff for their food service. Um, so there's there's a lot of opportunity out there. <clears throat> and in terms of contacting uh, new customers, just just find the right person to talk to. Um, in my case, I'm a produce manager, and I'm also a local produce buyer. Um, I'm a good person to talk to. Um, got some other things there. I would just recommend trying to s set up something in advance. You know, call ahead. You know, if somebody pops in on me in the middle of a busy day, I I might not be in the best mood to give them time uh, to talk about whatever they have to offer. But you know, I I try to I try to accommodate that. But not everyone is going to be so accommodating. Um, so I would just try to schedule something in advance. Um, business cards are good. Um, and I think Derek kind of spoke to the fact that I get a lot of people calling me during the season asking what 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 they need me, you know, what they what I need them to grow for me. And you know, if I've done my planning well, there's probably not going to be too much for me to offer them. So I, I would just recommend um, knowing what you do well, you know, have a few things that you, you know you do really well and offer those first before you before you ask what else, what else do you need. Um, and try to plan ahead so so you know you have a market for your, your crop. Um, So in terms of our system at New Pioneer, um, planning is key, as Derek talked about. I meet with growers uh, usually right after the new year. In January, sometimes it goes into February. So I meet with growers one-on-one. -on -one. 
and we sit down and we talk about what went well in the last season and and you know generally if things went well then i i will make a commitment to that grower again so we have lots of long-term growers at the co-op derek's been selling to us for i don't know how many years six Seven, oh, geez. eight years. Well, I w- before there was a Corvo store, and if it just turned ten, so wow. <laughs> so it's that's it's been a while. We have other we have grower in Iowa City Friendly Farm. They've been growing, selling to us for twenty plus years. So these are long term relationships, and you know we have we have growers that are happy working with us, and and um, it it does make planning easier. Um, some things are. You know, it's just kind of a given. It's going to happen again next year. Um, so, and and some some crops do take a time investment. We we had a situation a few years ago with asparagus where um, the farm we were getting our asparagus from was plowed under and it's slated for development. And so all of a sudden we're we're without our supply of asparagus and it takes time to get that crop established. And Derek was one of the growers that, you know, he came to me and he's like, you know, I'd like to I'd like to do this, but I I kinda wanna know that I'm gonna be able to sell it to you. So I think he put in an acre of asparagus and you know, it's it's finally starting starting to come to light and we went went three years where it was a struggle sourcing asparagus locally. Um Another one, blueberries. I again, we had a we had a good grower for a number of years on blueberries, and that that property got sold, and now it's it's not managed to to accommodate us, and so I I have no source of local blueberries right now, which I would love to have, and it, that's that's something that's a time investment. Um, so trying to find that, it's it's not going to happen this year, and I I talked a little bit about organic certification um, so some of the products that we do sell are are truly conventionally grown is how we refer to them they are sprayed with synthetic pesticides and synthetic fertilizers are used primarily sweet corn um, that would be the number one um, to some extent yeah that, that would be that would be the big one um, we do sell regionally grown peaches from Missouri that are um, conventionally grown. Um, that's a good product for us, but trying to source that organically, it's haven't been able to find that product organically grown. It's tree fruit and in the Midwest. It's it's very um, finicky and pest and disease prone. Um, so we talked a little bit about the purchase agreement. It's a paper document, and it's a commitment between the grower and New Pioneer. Um, it provides a guaranteed market to the grower. I'll give I'll give estimates to the growers um, on on what we need um, in a given week, and that'll give them an idea of what they need to grow, and and it makes them uh, comfortable to grow a certain amount of crop, knowing they have a market. Um, and Derek mentioned earlier the term primary grower. That's our designation for uh, the grower that we'll make a commitment to on a certain crop. So generally for lettuce, as Derek gave an example, we'll make a commitment to him to buy uh, red leaf lettuce. But I, I get specific with that because I have another grower that I buy romaine lettuce and green leaf lettuce from. So. We want to have an understanding on on the variety rather than just saying yeah, I'm committing to you on lettuce. And my biggest concern with with the purchase agreements is I don't want to overcommit and leave growers with too much product. Um, it's not going to help me have growers that want to work with New Pioneer um, if I leave them hanging and they're out a bunch of money because we didn't buy their product. It would be really easy for me to do that and say yes I'll buy I'll buy tomatoes from you and you and you and then I'll have a guaranteed supply but I I prefer to be fair to fair to growers and it comes back to bite me every year because you know like 
years like last year where we had tons of rain. Um, there were there were growers had problems and issues and difficulties um, with providing the crops that we had talked about in the meetings, and I I understand. Um, so I try to try to you know work through those issues with them and definitely am willing to give second chances. Um, so some of some of the crops like. Especially on the storage end, the onions, potatoes. I do make two grower commitments, um, just to um, have have a good supply, and I do let them know that I am making commitments to two growers, so they don't feel like if I'm buying from another grower, they're gonna uh, be missing out on something. Uh, here's just an example of the front page of our purchase agreement. This one is with Scattergood School Farm out of West Branch. Um, so the the document of the purchase agreement, we I like to outline the pricing. Um, we talk about ordering and delivery, and and then the the commitments and uh, designate the uh, growers as uh, primary commitments on crops. So I'll have a huge list of all the things that could possibly be grown in Iowa, and you know I'll try to I'll try to get commitments from growers to to provide those for us. And as I said, I'll I'll give estimates to growers. Um, certainly, some things are bigger than others. Um, my example here is broccoli. We sell a lot of broccoli. It's pretty much our number one vegetable year round and that's that's another one I've made commitments to do growers on. Um, it's an especially good fall crop. And then the purchase agreement also talks about just the expectations of quality, packing, cleanliness, etc. Um, as I mentioned, the purchase agreement can get Pretty specific. Uh, Derek mentioned he grows Sun Gold cherry tomatoes for us, and I made a, a commitment to him on buying that specific product. I've also made a commitment to another grower to grow us red grape tomatoes. I've got a commitment to grow field grown tomatoes versus hydroponic tomatoes. I have heirloom tomatoes, Roma tomatoes. So all those can be different growers. Um, so I, I like to throw that out there to them so they understand that I'm buying tomatoes from others as well as them. And I guess that touches on the variety aspect. Um, for me and probably most retailers, the quality is the most important thing. Um, if you're failing on quality, the relationship is going to struggle. Um, there's two forms of quality, I suppose. There's aesthetic quality, the how pretty a product is, and just the eating quality or the nutrition of the product. But really, the number one um, of importance is the appearance of the product, because you have to draw the customer in somehow. If it's ugly and it tastes good, it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to buy it. It's going to sit there, and I'm not going to want to buy that again from you. Um, and I do note here that you know some customers that might not be as important with with restaurants or food service. You might be able to offer blemished cucumbers or something at a lower price. Um, but for me, I want the best you've got. Um, product be clean and washed. I don't want muddy produce. I don't want dirty potatoes. That's your job to to clean that the product before it arrives. Um, and I don't want product that's been sitting around for a week before it gets delivered. Most of our growers are harvesting the day of or the day or two prior to delivery, and that's that's one of the big advantages of my book because fresher product is more nutritious. It's better for me because it has a better shelf life. Um, and yeah, that's one of the great things right now. I'm not dealing with locals, so that's one of the things I struggle with is is the quality and the 
the shelf life. Um, and again, with quality, I reserve the right to refuse product that's delivered in poor quality. Um, so just on the grower's end, I would just get an understanding why the product was refused, you know, communicate with your purchaser and and, and try to fix the problem. Um, I would recommend giving them credit for, for product when necessary, but don't let yourself get taken advantage of. Um, and again, expect feedback on, on your quality. And I I certainly try to try to let growers know that there's something wrong if there's something wrong and I like to try and work with them to make it better because um, and, and usually they're they're really receptive and, and want to get that feedback. In terms of pricing, um, in our produce department we sell product in different ways by the pound, by the each, and bunches, which is sort of like each. Um, I like to have an understanding on price before I'll make a commitment to a grower, because if I make the commitment before the price is understood, uh, that can lead to some issues, and I could end up paying a lot of money for something that I wasn't expecting to. And our pricing goal is to be competitive with our local farmers market prices, so if a grower, lots of our growers do sell at the farmer's market as as well as to us. So they, I let them know that, you know, they're not going to be able to get that same same price from us as at the farmer's market. So we have to apply a margin or a markup to our product to cover our, our costs of operation, to pay our staff, et cetera. Um, so at the same time, we have to be, competitive with farmers markets because one of the struggles with local is when we're selling local you know there's also farmers markets in season people have gardens they're members of CSAs um, so there is a lot of competition in that that local market when it's available um, but uh, again I would say that even with that, in terms of wholesale pricing, where we give the grower pretty good um, money for their product. In the off season, we deal with produce distributors. Um, I got a question here about a would a forty percent margin be fair? Um, I yes, that would probably be fairly standard for for produce departments. Um, Part of what we do with our margin is to build in a little buffer to to account for loss that is inevitable with maintaining displays of produce. There's always going to be loss. I think what I've heard a national average is like maybe even up to four percent of produce in produce departments is just thrown out because it goes bad, and it's just it's just an inevitable part of the deal. So you. Try to buffer your margin a little bit to cover cover those losses. Um, and I always recommend to growers just be careful with your pricing. If you price it too high, we're not going to sell it. You're not going to get any sales. Nobody wins, and I'm going to throw away product, and I'm just not going to want to do it anymore. And if you're if you're priced too low, it's not going to work for you, and you're you're not going to want to do it anymore. So it's it can be pretty touchy, um, but we try to be fair. Um, and in terms of product standards, again, our grades and sizes of various products, for instance, potatoes, generally the produce um, industry has three three sizes of potatoes. A's, B's, and C's, so it's good for you to be familiar with, with sizing or grades. Uh, you know, zucchini in the past, you know, it, it just happens. You find the two-pound zucchini at the bottom of the case, and when I see that, it kind of bugs me. So 
you know, I'll dress that with a grower. And um, I don't need them all to be the exact same size. I'm not as I'm not as particular as some <clears throat> some buyers might be. You know, with the potato growers, I'll you know I don't want the little tiny things thrown in with the big clunkers, but I'm not going to be as picky on on the sizing as as say if you're selling to a distributor or something like that, where you're really going to have to grade it out and and separate your product. Um, if you're selling bunch product, I can't stress the importance of making a good sized bunch and we sell lots of bunch products. I'll give you some examples here. Um, you want the customer to pick it up and feel like they're actually holding something. Um, so that's important to note. And in terms of product quality, just, just leave, the, leave the inferior product at home or try to sell it as number twos. You're going to have some loss on your end, I know, but if you try to sell everything, you're not going to make your customer happy. Um, here's an example of sizing some bunches, bunches of California kale, because I don't have any local kale right now. But as you can see, they're all roughly the same size. Um, we sell these priced as each, so if there's smaller ones in there, they're going to get picked over, and nobody's ever going to buy them. They're going to go for the bigger ones. So if you're, if you're bunching, try to make uniform sizes. Here's some large size peppers. Um, some stores will sell peppers by the each, so that sizing becomes more important. I'll, at our store, we sell separate peppers by the pound, so I'm not as concerned with the pricing. It does seem like bigger peppers sell better, though. Uh, in terms of packing your produce, um, I would recommend that you know and use standard pack sizes. Um, I'll give you some examples here. Um, Produce industry is usually pretty pretty similar, especially lettuce. It's always like two dozen lettuce. Carrots come in 25-pound bags. Um, potatoes are usually 50 pounds. So some things vary a little bit more, like cucumbers or um, zucchini can be like 20, 22, 26, even 50 pounds. Not so much on the zucchini, but with cucumbers, yes. Um, sometimes product is packed in bushel on a ninth containers. Um, I'd rather be paying a pound price because the bushel doesn't translate very well to me when I have to put a price on the product. So I would probably recommend you not selling your product by the bushel, like a bushel of beans. I would figure out what the weight is on that bushel and sell them that way. And it's important to use the, the right boxes. You know, in produce there are wax boxes, there's unwaxed cardboard boxes, anything that has leaves, um, green leaves, you want to use a wax box because the unwaxed cardboard is going to suck the moisture out of the product. And you want to make sure you're, you've got the right size box for your product. Um, this is important boxes. You need to be able to close them. You want to be able to stack them. Um, you don't want to deliver a product without a top. Uh, my, my compatriot, the produce manager at the downtown store, he's been there for 35 years. He'll talk about the bad old days of local produce, people delivering produce in, uh, like, uh, what do you call them, uh, like closed baskets or just open boxes, things like that, or where they bring it in in a tub and you'd have to transfer it. It's, these are all things that are going to discourage your, your purchaser. So um, packing is very important. And it's also important to label your boxes with your farm name, what's in the box, how much is in there. Here's some, some examples of some packing. Again, it's all uh, California product because it's March now. Uh, and as you see, uh, you got the cabbage here is in the biggest box. You got your 24 count lettuce, your 
14 count munch broccoli, which is roughly 18 to 20 pounds, and your 30 count parsley over here. It should I should note here I'm packing a step that probably most local small growers aren't going to be able to take, but lots of produce comes packed in ice. Broccoli especially is packed in ice. Cilantro or this parsley here, it comes packed in ice. And there's a, a layer of paper over the product here, and then the ice is on top. It, it just helps keep the product hydrated and um, preserve it longer, especially broccoli. Um, if it's not iced, you know, a week out, it's going to turn yellow, definitely. And shipping out of California might not get to us for a week or, you know, so that's why they do it. But it might not be as important in local, but if you're really looking to go big, you got to think about ice on your veggies. Um, here's an example of some labeling. Uh, again, if you're if you are certified organic, use the label. You know you paid for it, but you got the farm name. You got the product. Here they even have the organic certifier. Just a few more points on the boxes. Um, I know they're expensive. Not not every purchaser is going to think about that. We do uh, save wax boxes and even some cardboard boxes for customers or for our growers. Um, and you know, as long as they're clean and reusable, we'll, we'll let them use them again, and that that'll save some money. And I recommend weighing your product accurately. You know, I don't want to be paying for the weight of your box. Boxes can easily weigh a pound, and if I'm paying five dollars a pound for some, I don't want to pay five dollars for that box and get also one less pound of product. Um, so it is something that your your purchaser might you know, address with you on. So take that into consideration. Huh, getting away from quality, I I encourage all the growers that I deal with to brand their farm. I encourage them to make a logo for, for the farm. Um, it's important for you to let your customers know who you are and where you're from. We definitely do that in the store through our marketing department. Um, we really like to put a face on the food, let let customers know we got pictures of growers in our store. Um, try to let them know the grower's story. Um, but and I I recommend creating labels um, that you can use on certain products, packed products especially. And you know try to come up with new ways to market your product. And I'll have a few examples here of some local products we actually have in the store now. Here's a good example of labeling. It's a local product. Uh, you got your USDA organic. This guy's really into buy fresh, buy local. Um, so he likes to put that on. He wants to get that out there. Um, he's, you know, he's even gone so far as to get a PLU on here for us, which is important on our end. Um, he's got a sell by date says where it's from, just excellent packaging. And here is another one. Here's a, another locally grown product. These are little mini cucumbers packed in a tray. It's a very popular product. I can't get enough of them. Again, good labeling. It's This isn't a certified organic product, but often our customers don't really care if it's local. They trust it more. Um, here's another uh, local product, the uh, mushrooms I talked about earlier. Again, good labeling. She did put her phone number on here. I don't know if I'd recommend doing that. Um, and 
Here's some locally grown herbs out of Grinnell, Iowa. Um, another year-round product. It's great to have. Um, ordering procedure. Most of our orders we do by phone. Our growers will call us and usually we'll place the order a day before delivery. Um, I'm doing more with email lately. It seems like more of the farmers I deal with are email capable and that's that can be pretty handy. Um, something that's been really helpful to me is getting a product availability from from growers. I've, I've been strongly encouraging that. Um, give me a weekly update on what they have available. Um, it helps me plan on my buying. Um, and part of the challenge for me, um, buying local, I, I'm dealing with more people. It's, it's a lot harder for me. Uh, I get more phone calls. I have to talk to more people, um, trying to keep stuff straight, who I bought from what, when I think something's gapping, I gotta buy from California. It can get pretty confusing and it is a lot more work. So sometimes I'll get frustrated because it's, you know, I get stressed out, but um, it is rewarding. But, you know, you might find food purchasers who just don't wanna deal with it just because it's easier to buy it off the truck from a distributor. Um, I try to develop a regular delivery schedule with growers. Often it's uh, twice a week delivery. It's Derek here, he, he said he delivers twice a week. Um, I get a Tuesday and a, a Friday delivery from him, and that, that usually works out well enough. Some some things you might need um, more deliveries on. Um, certain products are more perishable, and I'll, I'll expect uh, to get maybe three deliveries on. We have a sweet corn grower that delivers up to seven days a week for us, and that's great because we all know that, that the eating quality of the sweet corn degrades quickly. Um, so it's nice to have that fresh product every day. But depending on how far you are from your customer, you know that might not be um, much of a reality. Uh, and I do expect our growers to deliver to our stores. Um, we're not equipped to go pick up deliveries from growers. It's its just not part of the deal. Um, and I, you know, I understand there there will be problems sometimes, late deliveries, if it's raining or something, get a frost you weren't expecting. Oh, I don't have this product all of a sudden. Just, I, I just want to know as soon as possible from the growers. So, because I can always get the product from somewhere else. I mean, being local is just just an advantage and it's it's what we want but I you know if you let me know I can I can fill in with a product from elsewhere um, in terms of cut and checks uh, we expect the growers to provide us with uh, itemized invoices upon delivery uh, we require that these invoices be signed by staff generally the grower will keep a copy uh, for their records and as I say here, the computer-generated invoices are becoming more common. Uh, they look neater. They're easier for our, our um, financial staff to process. Um, and once a week, our financial department will run through invoices, and our growers will receive a check uh, usually once a week if they made deliveries in that prior week. Um, so those are just mailed directly to the grower. We don't pay cash on delivery or anything like that. Some customers might, but that's that's not how we operate. A um, couple different buying uh, payment methods here. Generally, we're we're buying outright. Once we we buy the product, we own it. Uh, uh, we do work with a couple growers on a consignment basis, and really, that's by their choice, and it. It does allow them um, some advantages. Um, they can bring in as much product as they want, really, because we're only paying for what what sells. Um, on consignment, also, we're able to offer a slightly lower margin, so the price point can be a little better. But don't just completely dismiss consignment. It can be um, a bad situation, but we do have some growers that, that are perfectly happy with that arrangement. Um, but mostly we, we pay for everything we buy. Uh, maintaining a steady supply. So here's what I gotta do. I gotta fill this space. 
here, here. Um, so as I say here, in, in peak, you know, three quarters of this or more can be local product, but as I talked about earlier, just uh, there with the seasonality and our climate, it you know getting getting spinach or lettuce in in the middle of the summer or leeks and in the spring. I mean, I guess they could be overwintered theoretically, but um, some things like right now it's really dry time, so you do have peak months of local availability, and they tend to be when the cool weather crops meet the hot weather crops, and then you have some help from the greenhouses to supply in um, those hot weather crops too. So June through September, that's that's the good times for local. Um, and again, the this times of scarcity right now, for instance, I have very little local, and there there is a lot of opportunity there, I think, in the future, um, definitely some restrictions on that energy definitely being number one the infrastructure behind that is uh, challenging the grower um, there are some large greenhouses in Iowa that that are producing year-round I don't know how they're making it work but um, it, it's happening now so I I see that increasing in the future and I would love to have more local product year-round And I guess I touched on this before, the fruit, it's pretty pretty slim pickings in Iowa for fruit. You know, you got your apples and your berries, your melons, you know, pears to some extent, but I gotta half my department I gotta fill up with fruit and most of it's just not gonna be local. So that's one of the things that um, you know, just not all these food dollars are, are gonna be captured locally. And I guess that is all I got. So I guess we can open it up to any questions. I had a, I had a couple of resources I wanted to throw out there for folks that are considering wholesaling. Um, a couple of books I used uh, and do continue to use would be The Knots Handbook um, and then familyfarmed.org actually put together a pretty nice uh, handbook that they sent out just for uh, wholesale growing, and I use both of those. Derek, I wonder if I might ask a question to start the questions, maybe, and maybe try to inspire a couple more here for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, when you're looking at it being a beginner, uh, what is the, it's kind of a chicken and an egg kind of thing, if you know what I mean. Um, what do you recommend for that, that person sure. who's starting out? Well, um, uh, as far as marketing uh, as a whole, um, I mean, the way that I started out marketing was uh, farmer's market um, and restaurant sales. Both of those can absorb small amounts of random products if you succeed or if you don't. There's not a lot of, um, you know, not a lot of pressure on you. Once I got some confidence, uh, I moved into wholesaling, um, you know, and I had, I had a confident ability that I could maintain a steady supply, that I could maintain the quality, that I could um, put out, you know, the amounts the, uh, that the store was looking for. Um, and then actually in, in my marketing, I mean, uh, CSA was the last thing I added just because that, you know, it took me that long to gain confidence. Um, so wholesaling was, you know, about the third one uh, that I added. Um, 
but you know once you it's it's nice for the folks that are really uh interested in farming because you don't really have to take care a lot of um you know all, every way that you market has a different uh demand on you and with the wholesaling you know um i'm able to farm all day as long as i pick it and drive it there you know they take care of the rest i mean you know new pie is open like i don't know it's almost it's what, 16 or 18 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, really knowledgeable staff. So they can handle all that side of things, and that's a, a, you know, a great deal for us, especially when it's like, well, I need to get back to farming. I don't so much have time to um, you know, meet with people and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, like I say, I started out at a farmer's market, a restaurant, got some confidence, and then, I, and then that's when I moved to the wholesaling. Um, well, crop insurance, I, I would say, yes, I do carry some form of crop insurance, though it's not your standard insurance. Um, uh, I have a CSA, uh, which, you know, um, helps me spread out, um, there's a lot of people that are invested in that crop when I have a CSA. Uh, the other form of crop insurance that I have is my season extension that I do. Um, I've been hit uh, by multiple hailstorms uh, throughout my time at the farm. There were two uh, that were were horrible. Um, and, well, being able to throw a roof over stuff uh, has really saved, saved the farm in a couple instances. Um, of course, then I suppose I should get insurance for the greenhouse so that it doesn't blow away in a different storm, but that's a different story. Uh, so it would be unconventional forms of crop insurance. I can't see. Um, I guess I do have a couple crops, you know, that might be big enough and insurable, but, um, you know, bureaucracy is not my cup of tea. Uh, so that's what I do. But I wish I would have been insured uh, this year on onions and on shallots and on leeks. Uh, boy, we didn't come through on those, nor did a lot of folks. Um, Why don't you discuss that? Like, what happens when you when you have a year like last year? How did that happen for you, you guys at New Pioneer, Mike? Well, you know, I'm I'm pretty understanding. We just had had lots of rain, and you know, Derek has been successful with those crops in the past, and I'm not going to hold him hold it against him. Uh, I wouldn't really call it a failure. It was just it was an act of God, really. That you get all this rain, he, there's nothing he could do about it, and so I'm certainly giving him another chance this year on those crops, and hopefully, hopefully the weather this year will be more. Um, conducive to him being successful. Um, here's a question about our markup or our margin. Um, I I think it's, it, the question is, do we have a set markup or does it vary by crop? I'd say generally we're we're applying a, a standard margin across the board. Sometimes we'll we'll go up or down. More often, when prices change, um, we may kind of hold a price steady and 
thus kind of increasing our margin for a little bit. And it kind of goes both ways. If a, if a price goes up, we'll keep the price steady and um, we'll lose some margin. So it kind of evens out in the end. It's, it's kind of willy-nilly. We don't really have a good system for um, monitoring our margin other than, than uh, monthly reports on our margin. I, there's a question here about meat, and I'm sorry, I, I cannot answer um, really anything about meat. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. We do have a meat uh, coordinator, and I would recommend anyone, any vendors that wanted to contact us, there is a, a contact link for new vendors on our website. It's newpi.coop, N-E-W-P-I dot C-O-O-P. Um, you should find a link there for new vendors. Um, we do have a meat coordinator who deals with all our meat purchasing, so I'm, I'm just ill-equipped to answer that. And I'm also vegetarian, so um, I, I'm sorry I can't answer your question. There one more question out there in the audience tonight, and if not, I'd like to give you another second to think about that audience. Uh, and while you're thinking, I might just want to take the time to thank uh, our guests from from Iowa City for putting together this great slideshow and take, taking some time with us this evening and sharing their their thoughts on this topic. Um, I hope uh, hope you found it enjoyable as well as I did, and uh, look forward to seeing you all next week for uh, our next farminar. Uh, with Elizabeth Henderson on uh, CSA members as partners. Well, thank you. It was fun.